It's high time that we try to understand the rich, complex history of Manipur. Quote, stories about Manipur in the Indian media were almost always about violence, wrote the Burmese diplomat Tantum Mintu in 2012. Eleven years on, it seems that nothing has changed. As we record this, our political parties have still failed to find a solution to Manipur's ongoing crisis. What I want to do here is to try and show you that there's more to Manipur. Let's look to its past, specifically its brief, dazzling imperial moment when it humbled the mightiest state in Southeast Asia. I'm Anirudh Ganesetti, historian and author of Lords of the Deccan. Welcome to Thinking Medieval, where every week we tell you something new about our complex, innovative past. Always feel free to check out our research and citations below, and remember that we're all figuring out how to think about our messy, bloody, dazzling history. We're used to perceiving Manipur as a distant frontier of the Ganga Brahmaputra River Valley, but the region's primary geographical concern for much of its history wasn't the North Indian plains to its west. Manipur usually looked east to the much closer Eravadi River Valley. But history isn't just centered on the river valleys. The most intuitive way of understanding India's Far East is to think of it as a subsystem of the Southeast Asian Massif, one of the world's most extensive and interlinked mountainous systems. Despite its forbidding terrain, the massive acts as an elevated highway connecting most of Eastern Asia's river valleys and population centers. It spans 10 modern nation-states from Vietnam to India, and historically the massive was inhabited by diverse cultures, linguistic groups, and ethnicities. Their migration and trade routes impacted river valleys from the Ganga to the Mekong and Yangtze. And due to the massive's generally poor soils and low population density, river valley states found it difficult to penetrate and control the region. This situation changed only with the extensive deployment of gunpowder and telegram technology in the 19th century. But the people of the massif were quite adept at forming their own states. One of them was Manipur. Situated in an oval basin watered by several smaller rivers, it attracted a staggering number of communities, including speakers of Sino-Tibetan and Austroasiatic languages. It was an important node in trade networks connecting Tibet and Yunnan in southwest China to the Irrawaddy and Brahmaputra river valleys, especially in the trade of sturdy mountain ponies. Many of these ponies actually found their way into the wars of medieval peninsula India, more in this video here. Now, one of the most prominent Sino-Tibetan languages in the region is Mete, currently one of India's 22 official languages, very much on par with Hindi, Tamil, Telugu, and Kannada. Manipuri historian Saroj Nalni Arambam Parat writes that the Meite were once a confederacy of seven clans, each with their own divinity, in the court chronicle of the kings of Manipur, the Chaitaran Kumpapa. The confederacy gradually came under the domination of the Meite Ningthauja dynasty and thus obtained the name. It was Kangale Park, the Meite state, that would lay the foundations for present day Manipur. In the 15th century CE, catalyzed by state formation by the Shan peoples of Upper Burma, the Kangale Park Kingdom began to centralize. Inspired by meeting with the Pong king from Burma, the Meite king Kyampa ordered the creation of a national chronicle called the Chaitaran Kumpapa, which recorded events from the perspective of the Meite court. This chronicle reveals a rich, colorful cultural world, one where rivers were harnessed for irrigation, where the people were warlike and loved sport, including boat races and polo. It's also surprisingly detailed. For example, an entry from 1709 CE reads rather tersely, 21st of the month of Lamta, which is February or March, Friday, a memorial mound was erected for Ningthem Charairongpa, the previous king. The wind was fierce on that day. Many trees and bamboos were uprooted. Two people who were carrying cooked rice were injured by the falling trees. Something even more memorable happened that year. The accession of King Mayamba or Pamhaiba. Threatened by the expansion of the Burmese Empire of Tongu, which was the most powerful gunpowder empire in Southeast Asia, Pamhaiba sought to centralize Gangli Park. To do so, he relied on an ancient South Asian legitimization mechanism, the patronage of Hinduism. Gopal Das, a Gaudiya Vaishnava guru from Bengal, formally initiated the king and a few courtiers in 1717. Interestingly, the king later came to be known as Gharib Nawaz, one of the titles of the famous Khwaja Moinuddin Chisti. Whether this was because he was charitable, because veneration of the Khwaja spread alongside Vaishnavism, or simply because Pamheba sought to depict himself as a Persianized ruler is unclear. In the previous year, the Burmese had demanded a bride from Kangli Park. And in 1717, under the guise of a marriage party, Gharib Nawaz's troops surprised and kidnapped the Burmese groom and his attendants. They also burned several villages under Burmese control and took prisoners. 
This initiated a pattern of annual attacks and raids between Kangli Park and Burma, allowing Garib Nawaz to acquire guns, horses and treasure which were used to subdue tribes in the neighbouring hills. All the while, he attempted to centralise his state, ordering the construction of vast irrigation works through corvée labour. In 1738, after fending off attacks from both Burma and Tripura, the fearsome Manipuri cavalry sacked and burned Buddhist sacred sites on the outskirts of Awa, present-day Inwa, the ancient Burmese capital. The Maharaja returned with a tremendous loot. It was the apogee of Manipuri power. In 1726, though, Garib Nawaz performed a controversial ritual in which representations of seven lies or clan divinities were brought to a sacred grove and smashed, after which they were buried under a newly built Hindu temple. A palace and several houses were burnt and new currency was introduced. The king's motivations behind these actions are unclear. Saroj Parad, the Manipuri historian, describes it as an attempt at the complete destruction of anything pre-Hindu by force. She also provides evidence of the persecution of beef eaters, the invitation of Bengali Brahmins and mendicants, and clashes between the Gaudiya Vaishnavism of the court and other sects. Citations below. Burmese legends claim that Garib Nawaz's attacks on pagodas were motivated by religious fanaticism following sermons to his troops by his guru Gopal Das. Gangume Kame, another Manipuri historian, also supports the view that Garib Nawaz was a zealot. However, while personal belief may have played a role, it can't be separated from both the royal and religious desire for power, a dynamic seen in similar events elsewhere in South Asia. It's also unlikely that Garib Nawaz's state possessed the capacity to enforce such measures at a large scale. He did construct temples in various locations, including the hilly regions, possibly to act as centres of integration. And in 1738 and 1739, hundreds of Kangle Park subjects took the sacred thread. The Chaitaran Kumpapa claims that, quote, most of the people in the country were made to take the sacred thread, but also mentions that many who were told not to take the sacred thread did take it in the following year. So, as a court chronicle, it's not an unbiased source. It's possible that the Maharaja attempted to use conversion as a means to woo and control his aristocrats while elevating his own status. His Hindu clergy also adopted local customs such as elephant hunting. But both Garib Nawaz and his guru were assassinated after the king was forced to abdicate and leave Imphal in disgrace in 1751. The deceased Maharaja was subsequently venerated as a Lai, though Lai worship itself was gradually assimilated into Manipuri Hinduism. By the 1800s, the Burmese devastated Kangle Park, leaving it an easy target for the British. Manipur's imperial moment was over. But the rich history of its 18th century reminds us not to take the states of India's Far East for granted. The assimilation of Sino-Tibetans into Gaudiya Vaishnavism, the burning of Burmese Buddhist stupas, these elements don't fit into the binary narratives that we're accustomed to. Through their geography and history, India's northeastern states challenge many of our assumptions about South Asia's past, and they deserve to be given as much importance as the Deccan or the Gangetic Plains. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear them. Follow us everywhere on social media. You can find me on Instagram at Anirbuddha and at Connected Histories, and on Twitter at Ekanisati. We'll see you next week.